Dr. Cater Hake and Dr. Galen Morgan, and I will turn it over to you guys. Good. Can you all see my screen on uh, the full stage? Yes. Well, thank you. You yes, know, sir. scientists love cotton because it's the most challenging crop out there. But for you, that means a whole bunch of risk and challenges. That's why I like to refer to it as the X Games of agriculture. And Cotton Incorporated's mission is to try to improve your profitability while you engage in that X Games. Uh, we do that hopefully by minimizing risk and increasing opportunities. We create new knowledge, innovation, grower objective evaluations, and grower outreach. So we try really hard to work on your behalf. And the presentation I'll be sharing with you actually comes from this gentleman. This is Dr. Bob Nichols, who worked for Cotton Incorporated for 28 years. He ran the pathology program. He retired in June and passed in October. And this is how he wanted to be remembered. This is one of his favorite pictures taken in Georgia by, by Peng Chi. So thank you, Bob, for 28 years. As Jimmy said, we've had to adapt to the coronavirus, the pandemic. And so I, I did that in a fairly unique way. I drove across the US twice to meet with, with growers and board members and plant pathologists, because right now I'm the acting plant pathologist at Cotton Incorporated until we can do interviews in person and hire someone to take on that role. So I spent uh, four weeks driving across the US. Thank you, Barry, for letting me do that. First, we took a little money out of the bank and we bought the smallest and lightest trailer that, that we could. Uh, something that was safe and self-contained and drove across the U.S. and met with growers. There's, there's Ava and on into Arizona, met with scientists and growers in New Mexico, into Texas, meeting with one of my most favorite growers. That's Wilbur there on, on, your, on your left, I guess. And he's always super, super optimistic. Any of you know Wilbur Braden? Just a, a wonderful delight to walk some cotton with. And up into the High Plains, in, into Plainview, and then down into College Station, in Louisiana, uh, where actually Jay and, and Marshall um, showed me a, a bear going up the, 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 the levee with the cubs behind. It was a real treat to see. Into Mississippi, and after two weeks, we were just exhausted and, and headed back home. But a month later, we started up again and picked up the other states and here's jimmy looking pretty relaxed with his crew really proud of the work they've done this year and then on into uh, florida and alabama with more scientists uh, more growers more board members and any trip across the u.s has to include the isbell's uh, flag just to want a tremendous photo opportunity uh, that is there in in muscle shoals alabama on into Portageville, Missouri, growers there, Oklahoma, and uh, finally um, in, into Kansas, uh, Moscow tanks at Kansas to meet with growers there. So I, I learned a lot on that trip. I was mainly trying to uh, get in touch with growers and board members and figure out what their concerns were, but I was also interested in pathology. And one of the things I learned is that every year is so unique when it comes to above ground pathogens. You know, the pathogens that are below ground, um, such as nematodes and cotton root rot and bursillium and fusarium, they're pretty stable from year to year. They're like weeds, but these above ground pathogens are strongly influenced by what goes on above ground. And so this graph shows through uh, the six, seven, six month period of May through October, doesn't include the latest hurricane uh, that's gonna hit some of our, our, our friends in the Delta and Southwest, ETA, but it does include through the end of October. And you can see all of those were stacked just about on top of each other, hitting Louisiana really, really hard. Uh, and on, in addition, this graph also shows the rainfall extreme. So if you see a low number and there's some twos and, and fours and sixes and fours, 
that's record high rainfall. So the highest is at the bottom. The 128s out here are the record low rainfall for those six months. And obviously that has a huge impact, not only on foliar fungi like target spot, but also insects. Uh, winged insects like aphids have a hard time <laughs> moving from field to field with these kind of windstorms moving through. And likewise, a severe desiccation uh, had an impact on the ability of, of white flies to move viruses. So every year is unique. And that's the reason that Bob Nichols put together these various teams working on your behalf on diseases, because you just don't know what's going to be a good research site from year to year. And plus, we want to understand how that weather impacted. So the first team I'll talk about is the foliar pathogen team, which has been primarily focused on target spot. And they've worked on management guidelines, trying to help growers understand. And these have been put out by the extension services in the, the impacted states. Uh, so we've got a pretty good idea what can and cannot be done with target spot. And probably the biggest difficulty is really predicting when you need to invest. So the team is now focused on predictive tools. And for 2021, it's going to add a new pathogen that's been uh, that's also come from Brazil, Ramulary or Aerolite mildew, a really tough one that's gotten a foothold in the Southwest in, in Georgia, where Bob Kemerate is particularly concerned about, but also it's an Alabama problem as well. But target spot is the main one that we've been looking at. It's an invasive fungus from South America that foliates the bottom leaves. And that's why it's really difficult from a management standpoint because obviously if it takes those leaves off too early, it causes the top bowls to be immature and low mic and low yield. But if it takes those bottom leaves off late, this can actually be beneficial in that part of the world from a bull rot and hard lock. It lets the wind and the air come in and dries that so you don't have quite a, as much loss on the bottom. So early versus late determines whether it's a benefit or it's a detriment. And we've learned that open canopies help, but obviously that's really hard to achieve in high rainfall regions. And we've learned that, that two applications of expensive fungicides can stop it, but boy, it's gotta be applied early, before canopy closure, before it spreads. So just a lot of, lot of problems. So what we added this year is we, we leveraged your all's investment over the previous uh, years um, to, uh, to get help from the National Cotton Council. So I want to give a thank out to Don Parker, um, who helped with this effort in, in bringing in outside funding to support 12 states, pathologists in 12 states across the U.S. on what hopefully will be a five-year project to try to do a better job of helping growers understand when it's going to be a problem. And to do that, these scientists installed a whole bunch of what these are called spore samplers. And you'll recognize these orange ones. These are just wind socks put out in the field. And even when they're, um, there's not a whole lot of wind, they're collecting spores because down at the bottom of that sock, there is this filter that as the spores go through, they get caught. Now, this is the exact same technology which is used in hospitals. Obviously, hospitals have huge problems with viruses moving around, but also resistant bacteria. And so in a hospital, they might analyze for 30 different pathogens with these air samplers. Um, with agriculture, fortunately, we don't have that many to worry about, but we, we still uh, can multiplex and look at multiple from one spore. Now, in addition to these passive air samplers, We've also got ones that are powered by battery and, um, and sunlight solar cells. And we've got low ones and we've got high ones. And we've got ones that, that look at the different directions. But this is the most unique one here attached to a, a spray rig. This one is designed to pull the air at different heights from the canopy um, at, through the spores. And so this is the kind of stuff that's really critical for creating that data along with the weather, along with the plant, 
that gives predictive models for tools. Now, we're not saying growers are going to need these. This is part of the trying to understand the, the models and give growers better advice. I'd like to next go to the Nebito team, because this is where we have the biggest impact, particularly this year and next year from your long-term research investment. So that team is looking at commercial varieties, nematicides, looking for the next generation of non-GMO uh, nematode traits, breeding tools to make these things easier to use, and looking at cultural practices to reduce nematodes. But the biggest success that we've had in the nematode area is this reniform. And I use this map from 2010 just to highlight the West Texas area. As I was in West Texas in the early 90s when we discovered, actually Terry Wheeler did that, the first reniform infected field in West Texas. It was an isolated spot and it spread so rapidly about six years later, it was all over six counties and it spread quite a bit more in the last 10 years. So this is a very aggressive, it's obviously very parasitic and damaged to the plant, but it's difficult to diagnose because there's no really obvious symptoms unlike root knot nematode and it's so desiccation tolerant, it's easily spread on equipment. So long, long time ago and uh, partially thanks to Bob, he started investing in non-GMO traits for reniform control. And the first one that you all invested in um, was lawn rent. And that goes back to a paper in 1984, first discovered in 1980, and it took 30 years to get that thing from a, a wild, weedy diploid, doesn't look at all like our upland cottons, but it had to be transferred upland and then once we had it in upland, it turns out we had to drop it. It was susceptible to common herbicides. Fortunately, Bob had the vision, even though Chemic was available and Lawn Wren was still ongoing, to start a plan B. And that was Barb Wren, and that was accelerated because it came from a wild tetraploid, so 2007, when that was discovered. And, you know, because the pests develop resistance, they constantly evolve. We've got to have the next generations coming along. And so this may be the next generation of a reniform trait here in a Clemson lab, and the next root knot nematode one may be coming along in Eastern Carolina University. You know, we do have two good genes for root knot nematode, but they're older ones, they've been with us for a while, and we really need additional backups. So here's the, the really sad story when Lawn Wren had to be dropped. Obviously, these two rows here look pretty pathetic. And it wasn't until we had it in Upland that this was obvious. Uh, here's Barb Wren looking really good and a susceptible nematode check obviously being clobbered. You know, this is an Australian bread variety and they do not have nematodes in Australia. They don't have our cotton nematodes. And so their varieties are hyper susceptible. But this success has been that uh, Phytogen Corteva announced that they've got varieties now. And Bayer has just recently uh, said they're going to have reniform tolerant varieties. And based on talking with the scientists, we think it's the same resistant source. So taking a long time, but available for multiple parties. The next pathogen I'd like to go into is the cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. Uh, boy, it's a mouthful. Um, but Bob Nichols did not want us calling it blue disease, so he insisted upon a more proper name. And that's an issue all the way from Texas, all the way through the East Coast. Uh, fortunately, yield loss was really minimal in 2020, but the virus is widespread and it's very unpredictable. So it's something we need to be continual vigilant about. And my main concern is the symptoms at the end of the year. Um, you know, this happens in cotton fields and major losses of bulls uh, at the end of the season are just devastating. Now, the early season symptoms are variable. They come and go. They're confusing. They disappear. But for these end of season symptoms are really, really of a concern. Um, we're fortunate that at ground zero for this disease, 
We have super, super strong virology teams in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. In fact, this is a picture from Sudeep Bag. Dr. Bag is at the University of Georgia, and he's right on top of this, uh, really helping create the science that's gonna protect you from it. Uh, there's a broader team as well. And again, I wanna call out significant leveraging for this, uh, help from the Cotton Board and USDA. We've gotten a lot of resources coming into this starting at the end of this year and for next year. The next pathogen I'd like to talk about is a fusarium. And again, Bob put together a really broad team because this is a belt-wide threat. Uh, Bob used a big word, it's an existential threat. Because once it gets into a field, you don't get it out. You're living with it and it's uh, very, very persistent and very, very scary uh, for those growers that have it and that can't grow pima or almonds or pistachios, which is what they've done in the areas that have been infected so far. Um, so the team is working on screening and breeding and biocontrol, uh, but also as we've learned from the coronavirus, we have to be vigilant for mutations that occur in pathogens because when a mutation occur, as we know with regards to the vaccine, fortunately that's coming along, if there's a mutation in the virus, that vaccine may not work. And it's the same thing with our host plant resistance or non-GMO traits. If a pathogen mutates, what we've invested 20, 30 years may be mute. So we've got to understand the evolution of this virus and stay on top of it. Uh, Bob did a wonderful job of summarizing the identification and the management. And at the end, I'll show you where to track all this down. Um, but this is a, a pathogen that jumped from Asia to California, likely on planting seed. And then it jumped from California to El Paso, again, likely on planting seed. And the really bad news for it, besides the fact that it's persistent in the soil just about forever, at least 25 years, is it's not controlled with either nematicide like TEMIC or nematode tolerant varieties, such as the root knot nematode tolerant varieties. And as I mentioned, the pathogen is mutating. But the great news is that it does look like there are tolerant uplands that are coming along. Um, Don Jones has worked closely with the breeding community to come up with tolerant uplands had to sort through a lot of lines to find the ones and then verify them in subsequent years. So that's really, really good news. And it looks like both within the private sector and public sector, there, is, uh, there are tolerant uplets coming along. So let me just close before I hand it off to Galen and tell you about where uh, the resource that you need to access to if you wanna get the research, the particular stuff that's really relevant for decisions. And the first thing I'd like to highlight, is, this is on our website called Cotton Cultivated, just Google Cotton Cultivated. If you are interested in weather, more than just what's gonna happen the next day, the next hour, this is a wonderful weekly weather review that, that you all uh, make freely available to anyone. It's cotton centric. So it looks at the cotton belt here in the US with an occasional comment about what's going on in some of the major cotton markets, production areas around the world. But also focus on cotton is our really easy to access webinar area that just about everything having to do with cotton production. For instance, on target spot, Heather Kelly from Tennessee, she leads this effort. And she put together, this is a 15 minute, just a little over 15 minute um, webinar that's designed that you can just scroll down to the various pages. You can click on target spot and you get her just talking for a few seconds about target spot. And then you can get more information from her or other places on our web. So we've designed this to, to deliver to you in when you want, you know, just as Jimmy said at the beginning, you know, growers want to, you know, you all have super busy lives and being able to access these webinars and this communication tool like we're doing today with Coffee and Cotton, um, you know, it's just great that these electronic outreach uh, methods have been developed. 
So with that, let me thank you all for your support. And again, thank the Cotton Board for having the vision to put these cotton and coffee programs together. And with that, I'll stop screen sharing and hand it over to Galen. Thank you, Cater. Let's see if I can get this going here. Yeah, I'm going to follow up on a few things that, that Cater mentioned, uh, but first I'll introduce myself. My name is Galen Morgan. I'm a director of Ag and Environmental Research with Cotton Incorporated. Been here with Cotton Incorporated about 18 months now, uh, focusing on weeds and agronomics uh, and working with the cotton specialists across the cotton belt. I appreciate the invitation to be here uh, from the Cotton Board and Emily and others uh, and ask me to cover some of the major uh, research initiatives that we have going on here at Cotton Incorporated and are that are supported by your your cotton producer dollars. So we'll get into this but I want to before I get into it want to highlight a few things that Cater mentioned. A lot of the things that will be discussed in this presentation uh, additional information can be found at the Cotton Cultivated webpage or the Focus on Cotton uh, website. And here I just wanted to before we get into this um, discuss kind of the importance of herbicide resistant weeds. I and mean, when the Roundup Ready technology was introduced in the mid 90s, um, weed management got much simpler, much more convenient. Okay, we'll move forward. I just will make the major point here that Palmer amaranth is uh, resistant to five different modes of action. Of course, that's one of our major weed problems across the entire cotton belt. So at Cotton Incorporated uh, and based on um, feedback from the growers, there's been a major thrust in, in looking at new weed management options. And that's kind of where we are with, with a lot of the research that's ongoing. A lot of it is actually new research that started in 2020. And this is a, a slide not so pretty of a uh, point to get across, but I think Cater probably mentioned it to some degree. So what I did is I put all the major crops here together, and then this gray circle in the middle is the overlap in the, major, in the major herbicides that are being used. So you can see all the major row crops are highly dependent on basically nine different herbicides. And that's only five different modes of action there. So you can imagine it's not just us in cotton that are putting selection pressure on it, but of course anyone that's growing any of the other major crops are applying these, these few herbicides to those same weeds. So the selection pressure on these herbicides is tremendously high. And obviously they all have a lot of value, uh, but the more selection pressure we put on them, of course, the shorter the life of those are gonna be unless we rotate modes of action and things like that. So a lot of the research we're doing kind of focuses on this and trying to look at new uh, weed management options in cotton. And I'm not sure if y'all caught the, one of the comments earlier before my computer or the internet went out, but this is a, a news article that was put out uh, from the Northern Delta region. The research was done by Neil DeBurgos at the University of uh, Arkansas. Uh, we're looking at the dicamba resistant weeds uh, throughout the, the Mississippi Delta region. And basically if it's red, there was a high percentage of dicamba resistant weeds and orange moderate and then green intermediate. So we can see in 2020, there was a substantial amount of dicamba resistant weeds already out there. And even more concerning is uh, some of those samples that they had, had increased tolerance to 2,4-D as well. So moving to the Enlist technology is not going to solve this problem either. Uh, odds are that tolerance will build up quite quickly. And then of course in Kansas, um, water hemp, which is a, a sister of a Palmer amaranth, they already have, they've documented dicamba and 240 resistant water hemp in one, one uh, different subspecies or uh, population of that uh, two um, water hemp, two of those two different herbicides. So it, it's gonna be an uphill battle moving here forward. So we're trying to get creative in a lot of the research we're doing to try to come up with solutions. Um, this just gives you an overview of the different research that we have going on focused on different weeds 
uh, and different weed problems. We have precision cultivation, uh, seed and spray applications, seed bank management, uh, resistance management, cover crops, um, generally just herbicide management systems and education and outreach associated with that. And then as I came back, I heard Cater talking about alternative herbicides and that work is being done at, at Mississippi State and we'll touch on that a little bit. But you can see we're trying to cover not uh, geographically, but also the, the broad different type of herbicide and weed management projects we have going on. This is one project we have going on at the University of Arizona. And I know you guys are not huge fans of, of uh, hooded sprayers uh, because of the, the limited amount of, of acreage that can be covered with those. Uh, but this is one that was developed and basically it's a, it's a hooded sea and spray technology. So what I have in orange here is the camera circled and basically it detects the weed and sprays those weeds under the hood. So it can cut down substantially on the amount of herbicides that being used and it may even offer some opportunities for new herbicides to be integrated into these cotton systems. So this was again going on at University of Arizona started this past year um, and it's looked very promising. I have a video on it. Uh, but I didn't want to show that today just because of the sake of time. But if you're interested, I'll be happy to show you some additional information on this. And this is the work uh, that, that Connor Ferguson is doing at Mississippi State, where we looked at uh, 14 different herbicides and multiple timings, and he had three locations uh, in Mississippi. And basically looking at products that we think may work, maybe they're labeled in other crops, uh, maybe they're herbicides that were you know, haven't really been utilized in decades, literally, uh, and looking at those to see their potential for using in cotton. This was uh, over the top applications, uh, but even if we can find something with a bit more tolerance, it may uh, work into, you know, some post-directed or, or hooded applications as well. And, and Connor did find a couple of uh, products, um, Shield X, and then there's another PPO product uh, that is labeled in corn that actually the cotton did have pretty good tolerance to. Uh, so we'll move forward with that. And then another area, you know, a lot of conservation tillage and cover crops are obviously being integrated in a lot of different areas. Uh, but precision cultivation is another way, another management tool to help manage some of the different weed species. And we're working with, with people across the cotton belt on some of this. A lot of the research, and I'll show you a video in a little bit, was done in, in Lubbock, Texas with Pete Dotre and Wayne Keeling. Uh, but a lot of this precision cultivation work is actually being done in, in Arizona and California where they're kind of fine tuning things in vegetables. So we're trying to see what we can integrate uh, from that vegetable industry into you know, the cotton industry. And here I'll just show a video of some of the work being done at Lubbock. This is just a slow motion. You can see the pigweed there kind of in the middle, uh, middles here. So major cultivation. And then you see the finger weeders coming through afterwards and basically ripping up those weeds. And some of the similar results they found, basically if you have, you really, if you get weeds much bigger than four or six inch weeds, uh, they're not working as well, but it's looking very promising on those weeds that are you know, smaller than definitely four inches. You can see the larger pigweed there, the sweeps coming through, and then the, the finger weeder coming through there and, and ripping that weed out. So anyway, this is, again, obviously not a system for those in a conservation tillage system, but if in certain situations where we have to go back to, you know, uh, management of weeds with steel and cultivation, we want to have these tools available that, that optimize your profitability. And this is another uh, weed chipper, which was developed in, uh, in Australia, Western Australia and University of Sydney, where this kind of works on the same concept of the sea and spray technology, except this is the sea and uh, cultivate technology. And I think I have a short video here on that. Let's see if I can get it to work. So in, in this sort of system, uh, you have the cameras up here on the front of the, the cultivator and it basically detects the weeds and then basically the cultivator tines drop down and, and chop those weeds out. So this would work more so in a conservation tillage site system 
Uh, we do have, we're working with some of the ag engineers and, and weed scientists, again, at Mississippi State to try to develop a prototype of this, uh, to implement some of this and try it out in 2021. They started building it in 2020 and, and we'll be hopefully putting it in the field in, in 2021. And then get into some of the cultural practices. This is a study that, that your research is funding down at the University of Georgia with Nick Basinger, the weed scientist there. He also works closely with Stanley Culpepper. But this just looking at some of the conservation tillage and cover crop type systems. Uh, in the upper left hand corner, that's conventional tillage. And basically they're, they're looking at the soil health and the many other aspects associated with uh, comparing conventional till, cereal rye, an annual clover, and a perennial clover. Um, but in the upper left-hand corner, we have the, um, the conventional tillage, and you can see the amount of weed pressure there. You go to the upper right-hand corner, and you can see the, you know, under the same management, with the exception of the, the tillage and the cover crop, you can see much fewer weeds. And then you go down to the annual clover in the lower left, didn't seem to provide a whole lot of weed suppression at all. And then you go to the perennial clover and you obviously see, really don't see any weeds there in that area because the weeds are obviously competing, excuse me, the clover's obviously competing with those weeds. Yes, there's gonna be some challenges associated with a perennial clover system because it's not only competing with the weeds, it's also competing with the, the cotton crop. But basically what they're trying now is uh, I mean, they're looking at this system to see how it, it could work, uh, both from a weed management and a soil health perspective. But what they're doing is at planting, they're coming in and basically burning about a, anywhere from an 8 to a 12 inch wide and burning that, that perennial clover down and then planting the cotton into that. So some of the tweaking that could be done is you know, how wide of a band do you burn through there to minimize that clover competition, um, you know, early on with the cotton. So again, this research started in, in 2020 as well. And then some of the other research we're doing is kind of really gets in depth, uh, looking at herbicide physiology and the genetic research on the development of herbicide resistance. And this gets back to some of the points that Cater made about the, the, the pathogens as well, uh, where you gotta understand the enemy before you can really beat them. So this is a lot of the physiological research so we can understand what's going on and then modify our management strategies or develop new products or things like that that could be used to fight herbicide resistance or slow it uh, herbicide resistance. Uh, there are some things that, that we're looking at with the P450 inhibitors, uh, but at, through a lot of this research, there's also the opportunities to possibly discover new sites of action and this is also one of the areas where we're leveraging um, funding from the National Corn Growers Association to support a large project at, at Colorado State University, where some of the most world-renowned weed scientists are working there in this area of herbicide physiology. And then I just wanted to follow up a little bit on, you know, the dicamba label that, you know, some of the opportunities there we were for a little while, we weren't sure whether a label was gonna be available. It was very nice to see that come out to provide the opportunities for 2021. Um, I don't have a lot of information that you guys probably have not already read in a popular press article somewhere, uh, but it's good to have these new products out there. Uh, basically, some of the major changes are gonna be this addition of the volatility reduction agent. Uh, there was definitely an increase in the buffer distance to susceptible plants. Um, there is the potential for hooded sprayers uh, once adequate data is collected for cotton. Currently, there's one particular model of a hooded sprayer, uh, Red Ball, I believe, that's, that's allowed to use in soybeans. But currently, we don't have anything labeled to, to work in cotton, um, hooded applications in cotton. Also, you know, they definitely distinguish the difference in a 24C and a 24A. There still remain some inconsistencies uh, among the different products labels, particularly about the, the training, uh, whether it's an annual or every other year training, and also whether you use a drift reduction agent or not. So uh, pay attention to those, but a lot of the other things are very similar to the, the 2018 labels. And just quickly, some of the other major research areas that we have going on, 
Uh, we have a belt-wide seed quality project working with extension cotton specialists. We have around 17 locations across the entire cotton belt looking at the seed quality uh, from commercially sold seed and also investing a lot of, of in time and energy and money into looking at applied research in the seed quality side of things so that we can hopefully raise the bar and learn more so that we can get better quality seed uh, to the growers. We also have a belt-wide nitrogen refinement project looking at uh, better ways to predict and um, know what nitrogen is available so you guys can refine your nitrogen rate. Um, nitrogen rate has a huge impact or nitrogen gas has a big impact on greenhouse gas emissions and our sustainability um, project as a whole. So that's a very important area. Then we continue to do some support, some soil health research, and even more importantly, some of the outreach uh, efforts associated with soil health. And with that, I wanna thank you for your support as well. Uh, your feedback is appreciated. Here's my email and phone number, and I'm sure Emily will include that as well in, in the follow-up emails. But to, feel free to contact me if you have ideas of things that we should be doing in, in weeds or some of these other research areas, and I would um, welcome the conversation.